Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Debbie, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Debbie. And uh, I just... To, I've had many people thank me for coming down here and uh, so forth, but let me thank you for being here. I mean, nobody I saw drug in, hogtied, roped, nothing. Everybody came in on their free will, nobody by the ear. I mean, thank you for bringing your enthusiasm and interest in wanting to learn about the concepts. And, and that is a big part of any kind of learning is that we want to learn about them. Um, and I want to, of course, thank Linda and the immense committee and everybody's commitments and all that you've done to make this happen. It takes a lot of work on everybody's part, more than just the speakers. So I thank you for making this happen. And I am excited about being here. And um, some of you might wonder, you know, what do the concepts have to do with staying sober and helping drunks? Uh, or you might think, well, that concept stuff, that's just a bunch of politics, a bunch of legal mumbo jumbo for those people. Well, my task is to try to demystify them, like Linda said. Try and make them sound like English, okay? And how they are all interconnected with each other. And like when we did the traditions last year, maybe get a glimpse of how they actually can be personally applied in our AA life, our professional lives, our homes. You know, and, and I think that as we walk through those, you'll begin to see some of that. There's a story that's been around a long time that really signifies the importance of all three legacies. We have the legacy of recovery, which is our first one. Our second is unity, which is the 12 traditions. And the third is the service, which is the 12 concepts. And this story goes that it, apparently a young man had just made his first year of sobriety. And he went to his sponsor, who was a dairy farmer, to complain about the behavior of some of the members of his home group. And he fretted that they wasted valuable meeting time with useless discussions of traditions and one actually had the audacity to talk about concepts, whatever those are. How can I convince them, he asked his sponsor, to concentrate on the one and only important thing, recovery? His sponsor didn't say a word, but he simply led the young man to the milking barn. He picked up a three-legged milking stool and removed two of the legs. Here, sit on this. Um, I'm going to fall off. I know but sit on it anyway. And, of course, he did, and he tinkers off of it. The sponsor replaced one of the legs. Sit on it now. And so he, he stayed on it a little bit better, but a little precariously. And then he replaced the third leg, and once again the sponsor sat on a solid perch. He said, the three legs of that stool are like the three legacies handed down to us by the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous. All three legacies are necessary if we're going to sit comfortably. So the next time someone discusses the traditions or the concepts, pay attention. And so that's a little visual, and I know that I work very well with visuals. And um, so the first thing we're going to do is kind of take a look at what are some of the pieces of literature that we're talking about here. So I know many of you brought books. You might have bought a service manual. You might have picked up some of the other things. So here's where, um, I, let me just say, I'm, just not, I'm not making this stuff up, okay? <laughs> I really do have sources. They're verifiable. My examples might be, you know, certainly not written down because I will have different examples based on experience. But what we're talking about first and foremost is this book, the current color until they come out with the next one because this is issued every year okay and so this this is a small version i prefer the large print not necessarily because my eyes are getting worse but you know kind of but anyway um <laughs> it makes it easier to make notes is what i like to say and so it's there's two booklets basically put into one the first half of this is the AA service manual which will review 
we're not doing this tonight, but it will review with you each of the different steps of service structure uh, that we have of different positions that people can have. Combined with the 12 Concepts of World Service by Bill W. That's in the back half of the book. So this is the Bible for a GSR or anyone in service. This really is your go-to manual. Another piece of fabulous literature that they've come up with is the 12 Concepts Illustrated. Again, provides pictures and all that. I love that, okay? So this is such a wonderfully done, designed, real simplistic. It doesn't give you details. It just kind of explains what those concepts are. Like the traditions, there's also a concepts checklist. A checklist is almost like a little inventory of, you know, am I doing this? Am I aware of this regarding each of those concepts? So there's actually a checklist for them. And then the real geeks of the world, like myself, um, have uh, the final general service conference report. Again, issued every year. Uh, the conference is held in April. We'll talk a little bit more about what that is. The actions, decisions, the events that happen are printed in box 459 as a quick summary right after the conference is over, but this is the final that goes to print. This is where I have gotten a lot of my numbers, so this is the verifiable source of the numbers that we'll be sharing tonight. I define an AA geek as anyone who cries while reading this conference report, <laughs> which is me. So I love that thing. And so then we also have... The 12 Concepts in Window Shade form, which thank you, Ray, for making those possible to be seen. A couple years ago, um, uh, my husband said to me, I have a, a Christmas gift for you. You're just going to die. No one, no one will ever probably get this as a gift. Well, you know how your imagination goes. <laughs> that was my Christmas gift. <laughs> And I told him, he's right, you know, that uh, no one will ever get that as a Christmas gift. <laughs> but that's our house, you know, and uh, we are definitely on the same page. Okay. As I mentioned before, I love pictures. I learn better like that. I mean, I know that the service manual is not a, a piece of literature or book that you will curl up with a cup of cocoa and a fire and read. I know that. So we've taken that out, and, and hopefully, you, but you will become interested in taking a look a little bit further into it after tonight. So you all have this yellow handout. Let's turn to the first page of the picture, the Cathedral of Spirit. A friend of mine did this sketch for me because in 1954 and in numerous talks, Bill said that he called our structure in society the AA Cathedral of Spirit. He said the 12 steps, which we've done 12 of those leading to the floor, the 12 steps are what we stand on with a floor that is ever expanding to include all who come here. The 12 traditions are the buttresses of insurance that our walls won't fall. So we have 12 columns. And that the 12 concepts are the spire of service, creating a beacon to shine throughout the world for all to see, and that may its symbolic finger continue to point straight upward toward God. And those are his words on the designing what this whole structure is. We need all parts of that. Once again, our recovery is made up of 36 principles, not just 12. I know many of you, as Linda mentioned earlier, you're going to have questions and stuff. Please note them as we go along, and I might be answering them, you know, as we go on the talk tonight, but definitely after the break will be time for question and answer. And I don't know if there's a basket for silent questions 
or you can ask them from the floor too. There is this basket for silent. How many of you have ever been a general service representative? Great. How many of you have been a district committee member? Okay. How many of you have been a delegate? How about a trustee? Okay. These are some of the levels of service responsibility. Doesn't necessarily mean you get a better parking place or better seat at the restaurant. It just means more responsibility. That's all. And those are, of course, service commitments we take which are non-paid. Our expenses may be reimbursed because it would be unfortunate to only pick people who could afford to do the traveling or the overnight stays at area assemblies or whatever the, this area does. But we certainly want to be represented. And this is really what we're talking about tonight, your voice. Um, the third legacy manual is really a document of procedure, kind of a how-to manual. And our service structure, guided by the concepts, was created to bridge the gap between our general service trustees and the fellowship. And additionally, it has put in enough checks and balances so that no one area has more power or gets out of control. Everybody, everybody has someone or a group to be accountable to. Now, I know we did a timeline, kind of a thorough timeline last time on the tradition, so I'm not going to, like, go into AA history. That's not what this talk is about. But I want to show you how they came about. It wasn't just one day, bored, twiddling thumbs. Hey, let's put a structure together. You know, no, it was never like that. So let's turn the page in your handout. And it starts with Bill Wilson getting sober. And that led to... We know that story of going to Akron and Bob got sober in 1935. In 1938, about 40 people are sober. There are almost twice as many people in the room tonight sober than there were in 1938. And at that time, they were already thinking about us because they were thinking about the service structure and getting going global in a way. So on August 11th of 1938, they created the Alcoholic Foundation as a trusteeship. To begin, and they began taking care of our finances and our public relations and, and, and um, uh, things like that. So they're thinking big, uniform literature. In the, for the year 2006, they sold over one million big books of all the different sizes and editions over one, and that's one year. That's just one year. They're thinking about public relations, answering pleas for help, aiding new groups, and providing experience. And again, in 2006, we have a total of 58,539 registered groups in the U.S. and Canada. Crossing international boundaries, we have 58 general service offices around the world in 180 countries. Recovery is blooming. We have our monthly magazine, which is called The Grapevine. And in 2006, the average monthly subscriptions were over 103,000. Now, all these numbers are listed there for you. And the translation of literature, this is what I always love to find out. In 2006, they had translated our big book into 59 languages. I don't know how many pieces of literature would get that. Maybe Gone with the Wind would get translated, <laughs> you know. Just a guess, but um, uh, but our big book is in 59 languages. Recovery, the disease is in every language, and recovery is growing in that way too. In 1939, the book Alcoholics Anonymous is published, and it contains our 12 steps, which is our first legacy. Membership at that time is about 100. Some say there were 79, but 100 sound better. You know, we, we like better. And uh, 1940, the membership had grown. Look at from approximately 100-ish, the book is published. Now we're about 2,000. And next year, in 1941, when the Saturday Evening Post article hits, we boom from 2,000 to 8,000 by year end. Whoa. That is growth. And there, it's coming in fast and furious and calls and pleas and writing. And they are... There's just not been anything like this. 
And over and over in my mind, I think about how this came about. There was no template for our service structure. There wasn't anything to copy or to start from and then tune it to suit us. It, this, this was an amazing vision of our founders, especially Bill, especially Bill. In um, 1946, the grapevine proposes what would become our traditions, but the original article presented to the fellowship, Bill used the grapevine a lot to launch and communicate. And he called them, and I like to, to bring this up because sometimes when we get, when we say the traditions, we think of, we get kind of, um, you know, flat. But when he proposed them, he called them an Alcoholics Anonymous tradition of relations, 12 points to assure our future. Uh, that just, for me, it pops off the page with what he's really presenting. So you and I will be able, there will be an Alcoholics Anonymous when you and I come here. There in 47, there was a memo from Bill to the trustees with a proposal to create this yearly conference. Because early on, once again, Bill saw the need. He's got to connect this board of trustees that nobody really knows about who's basically running our business. And right now, it kind of ends with, with he and Bob. But, you know, they, they're perishable. They're not going to live forever. So how is he going to connect those AAs out there that he wants to have run their own society in this small group which is able to do that, how is he going to do that? Well, he proposes this conference. In July of 1950, we have our first international convention in Cleveland. We're five years old. Excuse me, 15 years old. The regist Just a side note, the registration for that con conference, uh, international convention was $1.50. <laughs> in, in 2005 in Toronto, it was $85. And I read that the conference, that international convention literally had a 1% loss, which they considered a great break even. It was, it's not about a money maker. Their goal is break even. And the financials on that were a 1% loss. They were thrilled that they, you know, it came out there. The traditions at that conference were unanimously adopted. Now we've got our second legacy of unity. He proposed to that body, of 120,000 people, I mean, not that there were 120 there, but the population of AA at that time was guesstimated at 120,000 about this yearly conference. And we're going to start it next year. And we're going to give this a five-year trial to see how this all works out. Now, he was fought those years, those prior three years. He, did, he was fought by good friends who were trustees, advisors, he, it was not like, oh, Bill thought it, we do it. No, it, it was not that way. He stood on the firing line alone a lot of times. When the, with the traditions, they didn't want rules. Well, they're not rules. They assured our future. And then the concepts were going to bridge a big gap. So in, in November of that year, Dr. Bob died. So now he's really, of course, seeing more and more this need. In April of 51, the Panel 1 delegates came to New York. How they picked the first panel was that one delegate from each of the 27 states and provinces of the largest AA populations sent somebody. And he said once you know, they came in and they asked questions and they reviewed our finances and how about this? And he says, as I sat back and watched all this happening, I knew Alcoholics Anonymous was safe, even from me. Because he knew his own self and his weaknesses and his ego and the whole scam, the whole gamma, not scam, gamma of it. But he saw this was what he wanted. He wanted Alcoholics Anonymous to start taking responsibility for itself. In the second year, the panel two delegates came in, and those were then the remaining 28 states and provinces. And from the larger populations, they got an extra representation. And so there we get, began the two-year <laughs> delegate rotation. So when you, have, when you hear someone say, I'm on panel such and such, your delegate, for example, 
they will identify the numbered panel of their first one. So for example, our delegate was elected in, the, on, in 2006, which began her term January 107. She was on panel 57. Even though she will go to panel 58, she will always identify herself as a member of panel 57. The delegate who starts this year, excuse me, next year in 2008 as their first year will identify as panel 58 delegate. So just a little bit of what those numbers mean when you hear them, that was the num first year of their s delegate service was the panel that they went to. In 54, the Alcoholic Foundation name was changed to the General Service Board, mainly because they felt the word foundation kind of implies charity and paternalism and big money. And that's, that's, that, that was good when we started. But now that we're growing and we're really becoming our own and we are self-supporting, we're not, we don't want nor are we inviting outside funds. We're not going to go there. And so we changed the name. The second international was in 1955 in St. Louis. And here was another turning point in our history. The fifth General Service Conference, we've said that the first four, they were in New York. This is the only time the General Service Conference before and after has ever been outside of New York and not in April. It was held at the same time preceding the, gen the International Convention there. And it was there that having it done the fifth year, they knew that we could take responsibility for ourselves, that this experiment now had certainly been successful. It was at that time that we got, we were, the responsibility was turned over to the General Service Conference would now replace the co-founders. And so the trustees would hear from the voice, not of the co-founders, but of the conference, which is fed from the fellowship's representation. And so this became the middle ground uh, connecting us. In 1957, the legal bylaws of the board were created. In 62, the concepts, Bill finally finished writing those. That was one of his last, you know, big duties. He finished those, and our official third legacy of service was, was created. And over the years, the, the service manual and the 12 concepts, they've been in separate pamphlets together, separate together, separate. And I think having them together really is, and it's been together now for many years, but they used to be in two separate things. And then there is actually a short form of the concepts, which is what is on the window shade. So those were done in 74. At the 1963 General Service Conference, Bill says, but it is your responsibility to the future. You have to face the fact that leadership is not a question always of espousing popular opinions or causes. There comes a few times when your responsibility is such and convinced that your station gives you a wider vision than others have the advantage of, then you must stand alone. In fact, this standing alone is expressed in the concepts where there is such a concern for minorities and their rights and how often they can be right, and this also applies to a minority of one. At important turning points in the history of AA, it has become my lot to stand in those lonely positions. I am glad I was given those chances and that no grievous error resulted. Thank God. And I say thank God, too, for Bill's commitment to stand for what he believed, what he saw, what he envisioned as the direction and the right thing to keep us together so there would be an Alcoholics Anonymous for you and I today. The concepts are the only piece of conference-approved literature with a byline saying by Bill W. The concepts, as he would say over and over, are really an expansion of the second tradition. And that says, for our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. Because many of you will be hearing this for the first time, all I want to do is provide a snapshot of each of these concepts. I mean, I got examples and stories on all of them, but we're not going to do that. We're going to just do a snapshot 
because I don't want your eyes crossing about midpoint, okay, glazing over. And we're going to look at how they relate to each other. They're, they're, we're not going to do, I'm not going to review them in numerical order, but we're going to show you how they, how they flow together and the tools that we use. So, but let's turn, just take a look at our service structure. It starts with us, the groups. It starts with us. We have an inverted pyramid. Then your group sends a general service representative as your voice. That person will go to monthly district meetings. And all those districts, you, it depends upon the area because every area is autonomous. Some meet three times a year, some meet four. They will gather up at area assemblies. An area is defined as a geographically designed area, and usually it's based on AA population. Most states only have one area, the, the entire state. California, six. We have so many drunks here. <laughs> Drinking and sober, um, but we have a lot of sober drunks. And we have six areas. We are the state with the largest number of areas. I think Texas has five. A lot of drunk cowboys there. And uh, there's a few states that have more than one as well, but most of them just have uh, one delegate. So they, one of their purposes every two years is to elect a new delegate. And that delegate will take a two-year term, and they will go to the General Service Conference. That conference then will give our voice to those who will carry out the duties. You see the General Service Board, which is branched off into our two active corporations, AA World Services and the Grapevine. On the left, you'll see the various committees that each delegate is assigned to, and each board member is assigned to. So this is just our basic chart, but it, the important thing I want to say, it starts with your group sending a representative. Very, very key. In 1955, this was given, this responsibility was given to us, as I mentioned earlier, in St. Louis, and that's what leads us into the first concept. So if you'll turn your page to this handout, this is, sometimes I'm going to have, we're going to actually go into this book in a couple of times. I'm not trying to make it confusing, but I also think it's helpful if you actually open up pages and you look at it, and at least it'll be opened once. You know, if you never open your book up again, you'll open it once. So... Bear with me. I hope it'll be easy, but I want to give you some hands-on with it, too, to make it memorable. The first concept, the fellowship as a whole, is given and is to take the final responsibility and ultimate authority. But here's the question. Are we taking that role seriously? If we are supposed to send a representative, is your group? Is your group sending a representative? Personally, I would not belong to a home group that did not have an intergroup representative and a general service representative. That is our responsibility. That is our privilege to have a voice. I cannot complain about anything that might be happening if I am not taking the responsibility of showing up and having representation. If we assume that the same percentage of groups that send general service representatives is the same amount percentage of groups that financially contribute, that, that would probably be pretty reasonable if you've got a GSR, your group's probably contributing. What that would mean, according to the 2006 numbers, is that 45.5% of the groups are making your decisions for you. Less than half of the registered groups 
support financially our general service office, then less than half of the groups are making the decisions for all of us. So be sure your group has a GSR. But when you pick that GSR, be wise. Don't be hasty. Oh, they've got seven minutes of sobriety. It'll be good for them. Let's get them out there. <laughs> well, yeah, it might be good for them, uh, but it won't be good for the group. Because you pick weak GSRs, they're going to pick weak delegates. Oh, I like that person because they're cute. You know, I'll tell you, we want the best people we can get. We want people interested and willing. And so don't be hasty when you pick that person. There is a suggestion, only a suggestion, of two years of sobriety. And I really believe that's a great guideline because at two years of sobriety, you're still on fire and you've gone through your steps, hopefully, and, <laughs> and, and you need to channel that energy, so get them into service is my, my ad, too. In concept two, you see, we now have, as a, in mass of the fellowship, cannot possibly make effective decisions and manage our world services, so we delegate to the conference to be our voice, and that's our concept two. Well, we jump now to concept six in the flow because the conference only meets once a year. They, too, cannot effectively manage and conduct our world affairs, so they delegate that authority to our board of trustees. This conference we talk about is comprised of 93 delegates, and we have our board is of 21 members. That board is comprised of seven non-alcoholics, and we call them Class A, and 21, excuse me, 14 uh, alcoholics we call Class B. B is for boozer, in my opinion. So, you know, it's easy to tell which is which. Actually, we are only operating with 20 trustees at this time. We are short one Class B. Last year, in 06, after the elections of a new regional trustee for Eastern Canada, in about four or five months, that man died. The region was asked, what do you want to do? The region, all of those provinces involved, they caucused, they said, we don't want to elect anybody to replace him right now so that we stay in the rotation and we're going to let the board, the chairman of the board of trustees designate a fellow trustee to cover this as they see fit. And so at this time, the trustee for the western region of Canada is covering also the eastern region. So we are operating for the next few years with only 20 trustees. Which is fine. Again, that's, that's, they went to the people involved, the region. Okay. Now we go down to concept eight. And because we're holding the board responsible for our affairs, they cannot carry out and manage the daily operations. Therefore, through custodial oversight, they delegate authority to our two active service boards. So it's a series of delegated authority. And that's, I think, what can be confusing a little bit, and, and that's what I wanted to just really super simplify. No mumbo-jumbo is just simply a matter of delegation of authority. And we can even see that in the simple ways in, in our own group structure. You might have a steering committee, but they're accountable to the group as a whole, but they may... You know, when your group elects a secretary, you give them delegated, but they can't make the coffee and do the parking commitment. And do, 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 do. So everything gets delegated out. Well, that's in another way how you can look at what's happening here. Now, those two service boards that take care of AEWS and the grapevine, they are composed of nine members. So if you turn that next page, because we're going to come back to the, fold, the flow chart, but the next page, I've provided you with the current listing 
of your board of trustees, your clan. Now, this is, does have last names. Please respect the anonymity. Do not distribute this to non-alcoholic entities or publish or any Internet stuff. Please can remember about their anonymity as well. But you have your seven Class A's. You have your 14 or 13 Class B's, but I listed all 14 regions and areas. Then you have who your officers are, your board of trustee officers. And if you turn the page, then you have your slate of the who are the nine directors on each of the two boards. And again, we're not going to detail this, but if you want to look at it later to see how they're comprised, what the membership of that is made of, you can do that at that time. But those, that is your board and your corporate boards. Okay, and again, these trustees are not paid. Their expenses are reimbursed, but we ask a lot of their time. We ask a lot of their time. That's a huge commitment. Back to the flow chart, if you will. We're going to kind of shift to the right a little bit, and you'll see concept seven. We have two documents that guide us. The bylaws and charter are legal documents, and the general service board is responsible to those. There's also a conference charter, which is not a legal document, but is generally more powerful than the legal one because that's guided by our traditions and our spirit of service. The board as a whole is legally responsible party for our finances and our business participation. These bylaws identify to the state of New York who and what we are, what we do, how we go about it, and where we do it. That conference charter was created in 1950 at that first international, but it wasn't adopted until 55 when we became, uh, when we came of age, as Bill would say. The conference charter will nearly always be superior to the power of the bylaws. Now, Here's where I want to go into the book for the first time, if you will. I want to show you these documents. We're not going to read them. I want to show you where they are, what they look like, and just a, a snapshot explanation. Let's go in the, in the front half of the book. The page numbers are identified starting with an S. If you'll turn to page, it should be S90. S90, it or roughly in maybe a page or two front or back, it'll say Appendix A. Page S90. This is the original conference charter, and the reason I want to point that out is because they felt it is imperative that we leave it as it was originally adopted, all those footnotes are the changes that have come about since, but that we never forget where we came from. And if you'll turn the page a little bit, keep turning, then you have Appendix B, which is a resolution, and this is what was adopted in 1955 in St. Louis, making the conference now replace the co-founders. Turn the page, you'll see Appendix C, current conference charter. What this basically will do, with the exception of some footnotes that they've done, is they've taken the original and they've updated it. So you're, you're not going to do, 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 you know, all the time. It's merged the changes, but we haven't forgotten where we've come from, and we can have an easily readable document of what we'd have adjusted it to. So that is your, this is your current conference charter. This is what guides us. Continuing on, you see, again, a resolution, which, again, that comprises the whole picture of the charter for our general service conference operation. And then Appendix D is your conference panels. This tells you when you elect your delegate. Now, you guys are Southern, I believe. Okay. 
So if you look, yours and my delegate are elected in the same year. So they got elected in 2006, and they both went to the conference this time for the first time. I'm northern coastal under California, and y'all are southern. Okay. And that just tells you that you're different when, when the rotation is. Keep turning a couple pages, and you'll see Appendix E. These are our legal bylaws for uh, our Board of Trustees. On page 107, the first full paragraph after the steps, it says a couple sentences down, the, claims no proprietary right in the recovery program. For these 12 steps, as all spiritual truths, may now be regarded as available to all mankind. However, because these 12 steps have proven to constitute an effective spiritual basis for life, which, if followed, arrests the disease of alcoholism, they've you know, put in the terms that you can't be changing and stuff like that. We uh, contacted uh, GSO a few months ago and asking how many requests have there been. The number came back, 542 requests for our 12 steps. Lots of problems out there. <laughs> Lots of problems. But they are spiritual truths. They're not to be hoarded, but shared, but don't change our 12 steps in their nature. Okay, if we turn another couple pages, um, this is just a little kind of funny, funny quirk. Bottom of one, um, excuse me, S109, the last paragraph. There shall be 14 Class B member trustees. These Class B members, remember I said those are the alcoholics, are designated in the Certificate of Corporation as ex-alcoholic. <laughs> Only because in the common speech of man, an ex-alcoholic is an individual who at one time imbibed alcoholic beverages excessively and uncontrollably, but who does not now imbibe at all. <laughs> So anyway, just a fun little thing to show you. These are the documents that guide our general service board and our conference structure. So you know where they are. you you got to kind of a, a, a touch on them. All right. Let's go back to the flow chart. Are you with me still? I'm not, am I confusing you or, okay, I'm trying to make this real clean. Okay, now we're going to talk about some of the tools that they've given us. These are provided so that we can best perform in a respectful and manageable fashion, and therefore we give each element, meaning all services structure, and this is where it gets personal. These tools are where it gets personal, things that we can apply in our personal daily lives. The first one, concept three, right of decision. This just simply means that at any level of service, each element has the right to decide what they will handle on their own, consult with others, or go back to the group for guidance and direction, and they're even allowed to make a mistake. <laughs> Again, we can go through lots of examples, but one of the easy ones I like to use is the coffee maker. If the coffee maker is given that job, is not, you know, they know what time to, they should be told what time to be there, give, it, give them the guidelines, how much coffee to make, how to make it, but they don't need to be hovered over. And if they are also responsible for getting more cups and they're down to four cups and there's 80 people at the meeting, they don't need to call a business meeting to go get more cups, Okay. <laughs> So they have been given the right of decision to go buy more cups because that is part of their responsibility. However, if they want to buy a caseload of cups because they're going to save a couple of bucks and there's no place to put them, that probably should be consulted with the secretary or the treasurer or somebody because that's a little outside the range of what their responsibilities are. So in a real first grade fashion, 
that's kind of an example of what we're talking about here. Stay within what your job description is, but you know you can't use write a decision to abuse your description, job description, but be given the opportunity to do that, and you don't have to should not have to check everything out. Another tool we were given is write a participation. The primary thing for that was that no one felt like a second-class citizen. Let me not make anyone in my group feel like a second-class member, a second-class citizen. Let me make sure I, may, I want people to feel that everyone is important, their voice counts, and it's, we want you here, you're needed here. The voting members of that conference, I kind of mentioned or started it a little bit before, for 2006, and sometimes the number varies one or two, but it's roughly around this always. You have 93 conference delegates from the United States and Canada. You have normally 21 trustees, but this year, as I said, we had 20. And 21 members of the two corporate boards and our general service office staff. That totals 134 people. Our delegates meet yearly our trustees quarterly, our board members usually about nine to ten times a year, and our staff is daily. Everybody's input is valuable. But regardless of how many committees are on, they only get one vote. In concept five, it, probably one of my, my favorites, and one that again is applicable everywhere, is the right of appeal, like if there's a personal grievance, Someone's unhappy at the, you know, they've been given, you know, uh, inappropriate amounts of work. They have the, the right to appeal that without being worried about losing their job or being fired or, you know, gum on their chair. They don't have to worry about stuff like that, okay? But also, once again, that you can't use that to not do what you're supposed to be responsible for. But the minority opinion, I think, is one of our most cherished and valued um, tools. Every voice is important. That Bill felt that the minority not only has the right to speak up, but the actual duty to present its views whenever it felt that the majority to be in considerable error, or when it saw that a grave and mistaken decision could seriously affect AA as a whole. And again, there's some examples on that. Later on, we can talk about that. But this is very, very vital. But how do we use that? Can, do we use that when we're in business meetings? Do we make sure that we hear the minority opinion before we hastily rush into a vote? Has everyone had an opportunity to speak? I mean, not that we have to have the same statement made by 14 people. I mean, you know, let's be thoughtful of that. But if you have something different to contribute or maybe that we haven't seen... It's your right, and it's important that you speak up. At home, do I listen to the minority opinion? At, um, at, my, at work, do I listen to the minority opinion? What would happen if I did? How valuable that would be to feel that you were counted because you were heard, the acknowledgement of being heard. And I, I just absolutely love that concept. Another one we have is nine, and this is one we are going to talk more about, and that's about leadership. This, again, is one that all of us can use in our lives, and so we, he outlines fabulous tools for leadership. In 10, we're given the responsibility, give us the authority to fulfill it, kind of like the coffee maker. I mean, again, the coffee maker shouldn't always have to check, is it okay that I go get more cups? Give them the authority to do what they need to do so things can run and flow in a, in a manner of uh, fashion. But if you've got more than one committee working on things, be sure that you have outlined which one is the jurisdiction. And that, of course, applies more for our general overall structure. In 11, the other tool is get the best people you can for the job. But define the structure. We define the duties in 10. We define the structure of it in 11. This will create a successful organization. Just a real, it's a long concept to read, but some of the overview points that it addresses is that our staff, our 11 uh, primary 
alcoholic staff members rotate every two years their job. If they're on PI for two years, they'll maybe rotate into literature. They also have other assignments they're given, like they'll be the correspondent for our region, for example, which is the Pacific region. Or they'll be on the International Committee. They rotate so that we avoid any down, downtime in our, um, in our um, uh, it, office breakdown at, at any time. And they are also paid an appropriate compensation comparable to the commercial work world and are given raises for time served, not for performance. So this is a little bit different, and they, they explain it more if you're interested in there, but that's just the nutshell. Some of the commonly asked questions, and you may have these too when you're looking at the structure. Why don't we just merge the two corporations together? Why do we need to have two? The reason it would be too big for one person, A, also to find the person to, to handle it well, to replace the person when that time would come. But the biggest thing is that we do not want so much power and authority in one person. This has a better balance. Why don't we have the grapevine do all the publishing? They're, they're printing stuff anyway, right? Because they're two very dissimilar organizations. The grapevine has a monthly deadline, and we publish and print our books and pamphlets as needed. So this is, again, why we have two, the two corporate structures. And the other commonly asked question is, why does an AAWS just handle all the money. And once again, we talked about if you're given the responsibility, you need to also have the authority to fill it out. And they shouldn't have to go asking for money all the time. Can we go ahead, you know, and, and uh, print more, more, uh, more magazines? So we have, they've created this balance of authority and responsibility. And the last tool, Concept 12, I, I call it a tool, it's actually a summarization. It's called our um, six general warranties are revolved in here. And it's, to me, it summarizes those prior 11 concepts. This is another one that we're going to look at more in depth. So you've got the 12 concepts in a nutshell. That's how they flow. These are the tools we're given. It's clear as that. <laughs> we'll go ahead and take a break now. Uh, we'll take 10 minutes, then I'm going to come back and we're going to talk more about concept 9 and 12, and then we'll take your questions. Okay, everybody, welcome back to part 2. We're going to talk uh, more about concept 9 and 12 now, and then we'll get to your questions, which were fabulous. Thank you for the great questions. Okay, concept 9. Um, while Bill discussed leadership as to what we should be looking for in our board of trustees, that's really what the focus of his explanation and writing of that was, I find this to be one of these amazing tools to apply in my personal life as well and what I shoot to be as a leader when I'm asked to be in that kind of a position. He said, being a leader is not an inherent right. But we are given opportunities to earn that by showing our commitment to the group and in how we handle our job and our services here. Let's be careful, too, that we don't look for leaders that are so perfect that we take the personalities out of it. We will all make mistakes at times. We're flawed. We're fallible. And we may not conform to another's code of morals or ethics, we just try to make the best choices. So, first of all, let's turn to page um, 30, excuse me, 36. Now, this is in the back half of your book. It does not have an S in the front. Page 36, or I'm sure most of you have that red book, but uh, that's where you'll find concept nine. And this is the beginning of it. He does have some prelude to it, but here's where I want to go. Turn to page 38. Leadership in AA, ever a vital need. He's got some bullet points, and those are some of what I'm going to highlight and, and bring to the surface. And I don't want to 
shortchange the beauty of his words. So we're going to just do a little bit of reading. We'll follow along. Just some bullet points. On 39, it starts the second complete paragraph down as the first point. A leader in AA service is therefore a man or woman who can personally put principles, plans, and policies into such dedicated and effective action that the rest of us want to back him up and help him with his job. The next paragraph, another point. Good leadership originates plans, policies, and ideas for the improvement of our fellowship and its services. But in new and important matters, it will nevertheless consult widely before taking decisions and actions. Good leadership will also remember that a fine plan or idea can come from anybody, anywhere, and consequently good leadership will often discard its own cherished plans for others that are better, and it will give credit to the source. The next paragraph, point, good leadership never passes the buck. Oh, that's a hard one. Next paragraph, point. A politico is an individual who is forever trying to get the people what they want. A statesman is an individual who can carefully discriminate when and when not to do this. He recognizes that even large majorities, when badly disturbed or uninformed, can once in a while be dead wrong. Next paragraph. Nothing, however, can be more fatal to leadership than opposition for opposition's sake. It can never be, let's have it our way or no way at all. And if you skip it down a couple lines, then there is the opposition that casts its vote saying, no, we don't like it. No real reasons are ever given. This won't do. When called upon, leadership must always give its reasons and good ones. The next paragraph, point. Then, too, a leader must realize that even very prideful or angry people can sometimes be dead right when the calm, oh, I know it, it's hard, when the calm and the more humble are quite mistaken. I know that's really hard to hear that, isn't it? So, but we're going to talk about that in a second. Next, skip two paragraphs. The last one is another point. Another qualification for leadership is give and take the ability to, I love this, Compromise cheerfully whenever a proper compromise can cause a situation to progress in what appears to be the right direction. And skip a few lines and you see, we cannot, however, compromise always. Now and then it is truly necessary to stick flat-footed to one's conviction about an issue until it is settled. So once again, I need to know when to compromise and when I just, I don't have to be ugly about standing firm in what I believe is the right thing. I may not change your mind, but that's okay. But I, this would be crossing a, a, an appropriate line of principles for me. But I don't have to be ugly and mean about it to you. I just need to stand firm on that. The next paragraph, these, these three are so powerful. The leadership is often called upon to face heavy and sometimes long-continued criticism. This is the acid test. You know, no one likes criticism. I, I know that I've made just the gentlest of suggestions sometimes. And it sounds like I was yelling at the top of my lungs because that's how it felt to them. So what I'm, my goal is always to just be able to stand there and accept and hear what is being said. And again, we'll talk about that more specifically in a second, but n nobody likes criticism. We all want to do the best job we can. We're all going to do the best job we can. But that life will include this. So how do I best handle it? Okay, we, we've got our... Constructive critics, he says, our friends, we give them a careful hearing. And in the next paragraph, we have our destructive critics. They power drive, they're politickers, they make accusations. Maybe they're violent and malicious. They pitch gobs of rumors, gossip, and general scuttlebutt to gain their ends. All for the good of AA, of course. But in AA, we have at last learned that these folks, and I love this line, who may be a trifle sicker than the rest of us, need not be really destructive at all, depending very much on how we relate ourselves to them. Now, this is the gold. This next paragraph is the gold. 
to begin with, we ought to listen carefully to what they say. Sometimes they are telling the whole truth, at other times a little truth. More often, though, they are just rationalizing themselves into nonsense. If we are within range, the whole truth, the half-truth, or no truth at all can prove equally unpleasant to us. That is why we have to listen so carefully. If they've got the whole truth or even a little truth, here's the, here's the tools we get, okay? Then we had better thank them and get on with our respective inventories admitting we were wrong. How grown up is that? If it is nonsense, we can ignore it or we can lay all the cards on the table and try to persuade them. But failing this, okay, because he knows it's like you're going to try it, but you will fail. Uh, failing this, we can be sorry they are too sick to listen and we can try to forget the whole business. There are few better means of self-survey and of developing genuine patience than the workouts these usually well-meaning but erratic brother members afford us. This is always a large order, and we shall sometimes fail to make good on it ourselves, but we must keep trying. I have referred more people to those three paragraphs, especially this concept as a whole, but it always boils down to they're not doing what I want them to do. I'm having problems with this, having problems with that. If I boiled this down to a phrase, what this would be to me is I am being taught how to separate the information from the emotional delivery. Is there, that's why I have to listen so carefully. Is there any validity? It's just so hard when someone comes at you which you're feeling attacked. What's the natural human thing? Attack back, get defensive, I shut down because I'm preparing my retort. But am I listening? Am I angry because they're, I'm, I'm busted on something, I'm guilty about something, and I don't want to have been found out? I don't know. But this is why our guideline, if there's something to it, thank them, get on with my inventory, and go on about my business. If not, how can I let that go? They're just too sick to listen. I like that part because it just makes it better. Um, that's what I always get to. They're just too sick to listen. Um, the next um, paragraph, now we come to the all-important attribute of vision. Vision is, I think, now this is Bill's writing. I'm, I'm not making this stuff up. This is Bill's writing. The ability to make good estimates both for the immediate and for the more distant future. And if you'll skip a sentence, it says, well, it talks about we, we always tell ourselves one day at a time. Here's the definition as he wrote, one day at a time. But that valuable principle really refers to our mental and emotional lives and ch means chiefly that we are not foolishly to repine over the past nor wishfully to daydream about the future. And again, you wouldn't know of this kind of, you know, tools and, and, and gold is in here. And so that's what I want to show you what's in here. Now, let's go to that top of that next page. And second paragraph down, it talks about if you're going to try something out, maybe try it experimentally. But that third paragraph less sentence says, and this is, again, about vision, whether it be in your home, your work, or your meeting choices. The temptation will almost always be to seize the nearby benefits and quite forget about the harmful precedents or consequences that we may be setting in motion. This is why when we, on a whim, on a personality, alter, for example, a group format, we set a precedence that that's now okay to do. When we allow things to happen, well, they're my friend. Well, next week somebody else is going to have a friend too. Let's be very careful that we protect the whole and not focus on the singular one, the unity 
Tradition one, the unity of the whole comes first. So be careful. Think about it before you go making decisions like that. It might be good today, but what about the precedent I'm setting? So that is key. Now, if you'll turn over to the next page one more time, everybody will relate to this. Second to the last paragraph. Once again, you would not know this. these valuable things are here. Second to the bottom paragraph, it says, this is particularly true in the area of 12th step work in which nearly all of us are actively engaged. Every sponsor is necessarily a leader. The stakes, about as high as they, about as big as they could be, a human life, and usually the happiness of a whole family hang in the balance. What the sponsor does and says, how well he estimates the reactions of his prospects, how well he times and makes his presentation, how well he handles criticisms, and how well he leads his prospect on by personal spiritual example. These qualities of leadership can make all the difference, often the difference between life and death. One more time, an awesome paragraph on sponsorship. It isn't about ego. It's about a responsibility that we have agreed to. What are we doing? Okay, those are the, some of the highlight points I wanted to talk about in 9. And then in 12, let's turn to 12, which should be on page 62. That's, you know, you may not know this, but that is one sentence with lots of commas. <laughs> I will not be reading it. <laughs> okay. The conference charter, which we looked at earlier, you, you all know where that is now, right? Okay. Was created in 1950, formalized in 55. He says it's the substance of the contract the groups made with the board of trustees when we came of age in St. Louis. And this concept expounds on the scope of Article 12 in that conference charter. Did you know that we can actually change the steps or traditions? <laughs> yeah, we can. Take a look on that page, the third paragraph. It says, but Article 12, but in our charter, it has expounded into the steps, the 12 traditions, okay? If, so if you think about that, stands in a class, an amendment or a cancellation of any of these vital warranties or changing the steps or changing the traditions would require the written consent of three quarters of all the directory listed AA groups who would actually vote on any such proposals and the considerable time of six months is allowed for careful deliberation. Although changes in the warranties of Article 12, the steps and traditions, thus have been made difficult, they have not been made impossible. The point being, if the majority, three quarters of all the registered groups worldwide felt that we should change something, it would be based on that overwhelming majority, not of the few. They want the worldwide fellowship to be in sync with that. Now, what's the numbers that we're looking at? Worldwide, there are 106,227 registered groups worldwide. That would mean we'd have to hear from, in writing, 79,670 groups within a six months period of time. I don't think we have to worry about any changes. But once again, it would be the fellowship worldwide as a whole that would feel the need to make the change. So, you know, we can't, again, get that many to contribute financially, so I don't think we have to worry about it. Okay. I recently read something, and, and, and I really, oh, I like how they're thinking. 
it said if you when we read we are going to touch on each of the warranties and it says if you in replace the word conference with AA group or AA member you would get one more time this insight of how that would apply to you personally so when I read these warranties each one of them then that's what we're going to talk about is I, I'm going to insert that so okay you'll see warranty one the bottom is 63 they're all in italics as we go along so if I read that with the adjustment it would say the conference group or AA member shall never become the seat of perilous wealth or power. So we don't have, want any one person in charge of running the group, giving directives, or, uh, you know, it's my way or no way. We want this to be a group conscience. And so the seventh tradition protects us from having too much money and rotation protects us from anybody having too much authority or power. The groups have never 100% supported our services financially. The difference has been made up in our literature sales. The general service office is our office. They work for us. And the late Don Nicholson, who was a Class B trustee from Fargo, North Dakota, he said, if you're not contributing to our welfare, you're on welfare. So I thought that was a, a nice way to make all of us sit up and participate. <laughs> so is your group contributing? Um, in the handout, if you'll turn to your last page of the handout, you'll see some of the numbers there. Just, just look at the stuff above the stars. The below we'll come back to. It says that in the, in, for the year ending numbers of 2006, the group only contributions. Now, the income is based on group contributions, conventions, uh, personal contributions, birthday fund, in memoriam, uh, all kinds of, but we're only going to focus on group donations. It was over 5 million. I give you over 58,000 registered groups in U.S. and Canada. Only 26,622 made a contribution. So it's not so much that those groups need to contribute more, it's more groups need to contribute. So that's where we get that 45.5% that I talked about earlier. Is that the amount of groups making the decisions for us? The treasurer of the General Service Board says that if each member don't, now you know we don't take membership, but they have this way of roughly guessing where we are. If each member contributed $6.37, that isn't even two Starbucks in one year. Each member did six thirty-seven, or each group contributed one forty-two forty-two, and that's of the registered groups, we would be 100% self-supporting. But that doesn't seem like very much. I realize some groups are more flush than others. But the point is, is your group contributing? I, again, would not have a home group that did not contribute. I wouldn't go to a meeting that did not contribute. So check that out. If you don't know, ask your treasurer. And if not, ask them why. Maybe they don't know. Maybe they don't know where to send it. Maybe they don't know anything about it. Then, then it will be your opportunity to share with them how to do that. So what were the area, if, if then they give us by capita. Okay, so in 2006, by, if our goal is $6.37, where did we end up? The highest area contributor was Delaware. They averaged $10.04. Those guys are always the highest. I don't know. They must have a lot of wealthy people in Delaware because they always are the highest contributor. I check these things. Okay. <laughs> My area averaged $4.46. Your area. <laughs> Three dollars and one cents, and the lowest was Quebec with twelve cents, Northeast Quebec. So we we've got quite a range, okay. But once again, are you contributing? Okay. 
So it's kind of interesting to see, again, where are we? Okay. The second warranty is on the next page, 62. Sufficient operating funds plus an ample reserve should be its prudent financial principle. The state of New York and the IRS say that we, for businesses like ours, we can have a one-year prudent reserve. Ending 2006, we have an 8.8 months or a little over $10 million as our prudent reserve. A few years ago, four or five years ago, we had just about a one-year limit, and they wanted to draw that down. And how they did that, well, they can't, like, give it to anybody because, I mean, we supported them. What they did is they lowered the price of the fourth edition big book. They drew it down, and when they got to the right level, that's when in July of 2004, they put the cost of the book back up to $6. Now, considering that book in 1939 sold for $3.50, and in 2007 the General Service Office sells it for $6, you know, we're, it, it's not like we're making a ton of money because uh, you can't buy a hardcover book of our size for $6. Warranty three, if you turn a couple more pages to 68, <clears throat> it says none of the conference group members shall ever be placed in a position of unqualified authority over any of the others. And this just simply reiterates concept four regarding the voting inclusion and the right of participation. Concept four is on that same page just a little below it that all important decisions be reached by discussion, vote, and whenever possible, by substantial unanimity. That lets the, this, that body know that the majority, the, not just the simple, but the strong majority support this, whatever the decision is. So, again, make sure you get your minority opinion there. Has everyone spoken what they need to say? And then you vote on what you believe is the best thing. Don't be checking over with somebody to see what they're going to do. And that's why I was like silent ballot votes, to tell you the truth, so that you can vote what you believe is the right thing. And you're not going by, oh, somebody, okay, I'll raise my hand too. Vote with your conscience. That's what we're counting on. Warranty 5 is on the next page there on 69, that no conference group member Act, mem group or member action ever be personally punitive or an incitement to public controversy. And punitive is inflicting punishment. We don't do that. We of all people can least afford the risk of resentments and conflicts which would result in a temptation to punish and anger. We don't do that. Now there's, I want, he, oh boy, once again, it's so beautifully stated. Turn to page 70. And go up two paragraphs in the bottom. Let us suppose. I want to talk about this because this, Millie and I were talking about earlier, this is kind of a clouds floating in the air kind of discussion going on that I'm hearing about. Maybe you are too. But let's not just talk about the problem. Let's look into the solution. It says, let us suppose that AA does fall under sharp public attack or heavy ridicule and let us take the particular case where such pronouncements happen to have little or no justification in fact. Almost without exception, it can be confidently estimated that our best defense in these situations would be no defense whatever, namely complete silence at the public level. And again, I, I'm not going to read everything, but skip over to the next page because in continuation of this, the second complete paragraph down, it says, but under no condition should we exhibit anger or any punitive or aggressive intent. Surely this should be our inflexible policy. Inflexible. We do not engage in public controversy like that. That next section is a lot about what do you do with tradition violators and things like that. Um, our general service office is not a police operation. 
Uh, sometimes you wish there was the AA police around, but, you know, we don't have a police operation. A lot of things can be easily explained by, uh, you know, it's just a different interpretation of the traditions. And he says that, you know, most problems can be solved with mutual understanding and good temper. You know, if we just, once again, listen carefully, be willing to compromise, be open-minded, things like that. We can most of the time solve these differences because we've come to the table with peace and solution in our, in our design. But I want to uh, talk about the bottom of 72. There is, too, a grave problem that we've never yet had to face. This would be in the nature of a deep rift running clear across AA a cleavage of opinion so serious that it might involve a withdrawal of some of our membership into a new society of their own, or in their making an alliance with an outside agency in contravention of the AA tradition. This would be the old story of split and schism of which history is so full. It might be powered by religious, political, national, or racial forces. It might represent an honest effort to change AA for the better but it would certainly pose the conference a question of what to do or not to do. Now, again, I, I, because of time and so forth, and I'm not going to read all of this, but what he's saying is that we would actually make the invitation to go. Go ahead and try it. We're not afraid of you trying new things or just don't call it Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you go to the about 10 lines up from the very bottom, it starts off, to all those who wish to secede from AA, we extend a cheerful invitation to do just that. If they can do better by other means, we're glad. If after a trial they cannot do better, we know that they face a choice. They can go mad or die. Or they can return to Alcoholics Anonymous. The decision is wholly theirs. As a matter of fact, most of them do come back. So we don't have to worry, but let's, again, not go into a public controversy. Just don't call yourselves AA. Going on, it says, in the light of all this experience, it becomes evident that in the event of really extensive split, we would not have to waste time persuading the dissenters to stay with us. If in good confidence and cheer, we could actually invite them to secede, and we could wish them well if they did so. Should they do better under their new auspices and change conditions? Hey, we would ask ourselves if we could not learn from their fresh experience. But... If it turned out they did worse under other circumstances, and listen to this, that there was a steady increase in their discomfort and their death rate, the chances are very strong that most of them would eventually return to AA. Without anger or coercion, we would need only to watch and to wait upon God's will. Bill has thought of everything. We're not going to be so Pollyanna that we would never, ever think that someone would want to, you know, leave AA or talk bad about it or that we'll always stay one big happy family. No, you know, he, he's real aware. He's a realist, a, a visionary and a realist also. But he really, I appreciate him thinking about those kinds of things in advance because that may happen one day. Now, one of the reasons that I um, wanted to kind of focus on that is if you go back to... The handout and the bottom part below the stars. I don't know. Is what is going on here in Alcoholics Anonymous? Maybe Southern California isn't the best place to take a look at it because it is such a large population. But what is going on? These figures are from the the conference manual, last year's and this year's. If we use the, you know, how do you determine what is a growth rate, what isn't? I, I went out of the, in the fourth edition, going to the forward to the second, 
it makes a reference statement that at present our membership is pyramiding at the rate of about 20% a year. So I use that just as a comparison, okay, because we all have that in our book. So if you look at the, at the numbers, groups and members worldwide, U.S., Canada, and so forth, and then you look over at the um, far right of the percentages of what increased in one year, but look what decreased. Where did the groups in Canada go? One out of five, roughly one out of five folded. That's one year. They're down 13%. I'm like, did they come to the U.S. because we're up 13%? You know, but where did they go? I mean, the reason I did these numbers is because I do this thing called by the numbers, and it's just, you know, a little geeky thing again. You know, it's plugging in all the numbers and stuff like that. But when I saw that Canada went from 62, 14 groups down to 48, I thought, what? And this is what spurred me to do this little chart because, again, what am I doing? What am I doing? So let's make sure the program of recovery is being passed on. And the last um, warranty on that same page 74 that though the conference or an AA group or a member may act for the service of Alcoholics Anonymous, it shall never perform any act of government, and that like the Society of Alcoholics Anonymous, which it serves, the conference or group or member itself will always remain democratic in action and in thought. In addressing the General Service Conference, Bill said, we, which means you and I, are the heirs of this structure. It's passed on to us. We are the ones here that are responsible for those behind us as those in front of us were. So let's each of us do our part and keep it strong and unified for those yet to come. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I know we have, I believe, a 9 o'clock closing time, so I'm going to talk really fast on your questions. Thank you so much for the questions. And oddly, interestingly enough, I had several ask the same one, which was, why do we have seven non-alcoholics on the Board of Trustees? Okay, because of time, I'm not going to... Read it all, but I'm going to direct you to page S61 in the front of your manual. It talks about non-alcoholic Class A trustees. AE's debt to those who do not share our disease but willingly share our problems is immense. Going back to the beginning, Bill wrote, In the days when AA was unknown, it was the non-alcoholic trustees who held up our hands before the general public. They supplied us with ideas. They voluntarily spent hours on end working side by side with us and among the grubbiest of details. They gave freely of their professional and financial wisdom. Now and then they helpfully mediated our difficulties. Written in 66, these words hold true today. Non-alcoholic trustees remain a rich source of wisdom and perspective, and since they need not maintain anonymity, which is the key, They can, quote, represent AA publicly. They do not have an anonymity factor. This is another key reason why it's important that we have our non-alcoholics on our board of trustees, and they're able to appear on behalf of AA. Another question was, how are they elected? If you continue reading down at the bottom, it gives you the election procedure. If that's confusing, I can maybe explain it to you in private later on. So that... (laughs) That is why we have our non-alcoholic trustees. It used to be, though, that they were the majority number. And in 66, they became the minority number from 7 to 14 alcoholics. How many people have tried to change the first 164 pages of the big book? 
I'm not sure. I'm sure many of you thought I need to rewrite this, so I'm sure you wanted to change it. But I do know that in my book, which is dated 1978, that there really are some changes in the first 164 pages, and I always like to complain about those as I'm reading in the book, book study. I like to point those out that they changed it in my book. So they really did. It wasn't like, you know, we say, oh, when did they write this? No, they really did do it differently. And if so, what changes have been suggested? Okay, and I just kind of touched that. Um, the concepts, if minority is heard, does it matter because majority opinion wins? And when you are heard but not listened to, um, minority opinion is very, very valuable. Please don't ever discount that. Your voice may have somebody go, hmm, I didn't think about it like that. You know what? I, I, I do tend to go this way. Now, again, make your presentation. Don't just say, eh, I don't like it. No. Give a good reason. Give a why. It, and please, please do not say, it's in violation of the traditions. <laughs> then I'm going to ask you, okay, which one? I'm going to ask you to be specific. Could you tell me which one and why do you feel that it's in a violation? Because I would like to understand because I didn't see it that way. So be prepared. Don't just be hasty about your suggestions. But you are heard. Please know that you are heard, and, and it is important. And it's not a matter of winning. If the majority feels that other way, then I have to then be gracious and accept the group's conscience. Um, what constitutes a member of AA? How does New York Board of Trustees define a member? The same way we do in Tradition 3. The long form states all who suffer from alcoholism, and the short form, the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. If there was something more on that question, I wasn't clear. What positions have you personally held for GSO or AAWS? What inspired you to do so? And my sobriety date is February the 8th, 1976. I've been sober a little over 31 years. I had my first general service commitment in Minneapolis as a general service representative. I have held that position in three different other er two other areas of the country three times altogether. I have never done the other levels of service like district committeeman or delegate or anything like that, but I have believed so strongly in the commitment of having a voice for that group. Time doesn't really allow me to do a lot of general service work so much today. In my area, those people meet so often. They have monthly meetings and other monthly meetings and lots of various assemblies and so forth. It doesn't really allow me the time to really 100% do that commitment. So at this time, I don't have that. But I still now and then will go once a year to an assembly just to kind of get in the feel and get in the air of that. And uh, it, it just became something that inspired me. I just got so interested in it. And, it, I, and I, like I said, I was two, two plus years sober, and I was on fire, and I needed to direct that energy, and it's been never ending. I've never gotten tired listening and learning about these concepts. And I think that is, I know what, we got a real quick question. How are people elected to the General Service Board? Will we ever have trustees from countries other than the U.S. and Canada? Not for our general service structure, we won't because there are general service boards and offices around the world. We're just the senior, most experienced one. And how they get elected, again, I'll refer you to the, general, the trustees in the front part of the manual that explains it very well. Or go and ask your general service representative in your group because I know you got one. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.